Hello and welcome to the Wolf's Den. I'm Dave here with Mary Ellen and today we are going to be doing Eddard 2 from A Game of Thrones. Absolutely. So really quickly just to recap, when we were last with Eddard he had received the royal party at Winterfell and had been reunited with his old friend King Robert. After visiting the tomb of Lyanna Stark to whom Robert had been betrothed, the king asked Ned to come south and serve as his hand. So right. that's just a brief synopsis of what took place so that we can kind of uh, pick up with Ned here. Yes, and then obviously all the other terrible things happened. Bran fell. Right, in between. <laughs> uh, a million other things have happened since then, but that's the last time we were actually in Ned's head anyways. So the chapter begins before dawn, somewhere in the Barrowlands, with Robert summoning Ned because he wants to get the heck out of camp where there's other ears because he wants to talk to him alone. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, obviously, they're, they're, like we said, there was a summons. Robert was already mounted and greeted Ned by saying it was time to get up as he had matters of state to discuss. And as you just stated, he didn't really want to do it where other people could hear him. All right, so Robert, actually, I think this is kind of telling about Robert. Like, Robert is a guy who's, like, full of life. And Robert rode and rode hard, even though there was no reason. They had already separated themselves by quite a bit, but he just kept going. And George actually makes a note of the fact that they had gone quite a while, but and they had were riding so hard that the guards were even falling behind and Robert just continued pressing on. And he was like, it kind of like invigorated him a little bit. He, he's like, this moving at a snail's pace thing is not for Robert. He actually jokes and he's like, if that darn wheelhouse breaks another axle, I swear to God, I'm going to burn it and Cersei can walk. Yes. He's like, we are moving so slow, I can't tolerate it. Which actually kind of harkens back to the war where Robert was famous for moving really fast. Mm. So much faster than the enemy would have guessed he would have moved. Because Robert's an impatient man, and Robert was like, nope, we're going to move twice as fast as they, think they're go as they think we're going to move, and we will therefore catch them by surprise, because they won't think we'll be there yet. So that, that's kind of perfectly consistent with Robert's nature. Absolutely. He is a man that likes to feel free. He doesn't really like to feel tied down by anything. So you can imagine that the weight of the crown and of all the responsibilities that come with that are choking the life out of him, literally. Um, he even says how good it fe feels to get out and ride um, and that he has half a mind to leave them all behind and just keep going. Yes. Um, and I actually think, just going back to it, they were riding so hard that Ned tried to yell a question to him, but they were riding so hard that Robert couldn't even hear him. Yeah, yeah. And, and they were actually riding so fast that Ned was having trouble keeping up with him, which is kind of almost amazing considering how big Robert is on that horse. And that horse, I guess, was quite a good horse because that horse was hauling ass. And Ned, who's half of well, Robert... Well, he's the king, so he's going to have a good horse. Yeah, but Ned, it's not like... Ned Stark, Lord of Winterfell, doesn't have a really good horse. He I just think that I think that Robert was more into it. Probably, and Robert was already awake. Uh, this is symbolic of everything that's happening here. Ned is reluctantly being dragged to this duty. So even while they're riding and supposed to be having fun, he almost has to pull Ned along. It's kind of symbolic of the whole dynamic that's taking place with him asking him to be the hand. Absolutely. 100%. And it almost seems like he almost gets to the point where he admits what he later admits um, at the hands tourney. I have half a mind to just keep riding and leave it all behind. Mm. Where later at the hands tourney, where Robert's completely disgusted with Joffrey already at that point and blah, 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 blah. And he's like, I literally would just leave. But the thought of leaving Joffrey and Cersei here to rule terrifies me so I don't do it absolutely um, and they have a nice little joke about burning the, the thing Ned said he'd light the torch um, 
Robert's like, what do you say? Let's just ride on without them. A couple of vagabond knights on the King's Road, our swords at our sides, and God knows what's in front of us, all that other good stuff. Ned said, we're not the men we, the boys we were. We have duties. You were never the boy you were. Uh, more is the pity. And then we get that conversation about Ned's bastard's mother. Which, do you want to get into that? We kind of outlined that in... Uh... Yeah, you should mention it because we're breaking this down. So. All right. So as we discussed in Ned's Bastards video, um, there was that one time, what was her name? That common girl of yours. Her name was Wyla, and I'd sooner not speak of her. Wyla, yes, the king grinned. She must have been a rare wench to make Lord Eddard Stark forget his honor, even for an hour. You never told me what she looked like. And this is where Ned's mouth tightens in anger, which is something that we pointed out. Ned doesn't get mad very often in the story, but he gets mad every time it seems that there is a slight or a reference to a It doesn't maybe. even need to be a slight. It just needs to be any sort of questioning about John's mother. Or... Ashara in particular. Um, well, we don't know for sure. It, it, the word Ashara is not used here. Yes, but we know he got really mad when Catalan asked about Ashara. And then we know that he got really mad here at the mention of John's mother. Yes. So you can actually maybe assume even from that that it's Ashara. Yes, because he got mad. He doesn't get mad when Leon is mentioned. Like we pointed out in the thing, in uh, the video. He doesn't even get mad when Cersei admits that she threw Bran off a tower. Or that Jamie threw Bran off a tower. Right, understood. But it, he gets mad here. Um, he gets mad at the killing of children and somebody men mentioning once a Shardane and this time John's mother. Yes. Um, he says, leave it be, Robert, for the love you say you bear me. I dishonored myself and I dishonored Catelyn in the sight of gods and men. So in the Ned's Bastards video, if you haven't seen it, check it out. We talk about the fact that he says he dishonored Catelyn in the sight of gods and men. And we talked about how dishonoring yourself in the sight of gods and men would imply that some sort of vow was being made. And because what do you do in the sight of gods and men? You swear vows. Yes. So how could he dishonor Catelyn by swearing a vow? Yes. Because they use that phrase... You're going to do this in the sight of gods and men. You're going to swear this in the sight of gods and men. Like, that is a common phrase for actions of note, if you will. Uh, Ned was going to make his confession in the sight of gods and men on the uh, Baylor's steps. These, these are significant things when they use that phrase. Yet Ned dishonored Catalan in the sight of gods and men, which kind of implies that it was their marriage vows that may have dishonored Catalan. Interesting right here. So this conversation is taking place. Um, this is the first real conversation they have. They're BS in writing, right? But this is the first real conversation that uh, they have on this little trip that they take. When they start out, it's just before dawn. And then... It goes on and on. Okay, fine. You don't want to talk about John's mother. Um, you're too hard on yourself, Ned. You always were. Damn it. No one wants Baylor the Blessed in her bed. He slapped a hand on his knee. Well, if I'll not press you if you feel so strong about it. Though I swear at times you're so prickly, you ought to take the hedgehog as your sigil. The rising sun sent fingers of light through the pale white mists of dawn. Right after that conversation occurs, it's now dawn. So this conversation is taking pla place at the... Uh, on the brink of dawn, and by the time it's over, it is dawn. So if John is the sword of the morning, meant to wield dawn, this conversation's taking place at a really poignant time. Yes, and it even the pale white mist. Exactly. Of that's dawn. what that's what made me think about it because dawn is pale white, milky. You know, that, those are the descriptions that we get of that sword. And at the moment that these two are having this this conversation about John Snow and his mother. The pale white mists of dawn are the setting he gave you. It's actually what happens the moment that the conversation ends, which is also kind of interesting. It's like it's bringing, the light has come. Exactly. Um, 
Ned points out that they're on the barrows of the first men. Yes. And Robert's like, have we ridden onto a graveyard? Um, the barrows are everywhere in the north, your grace. This land is old. But this is something that I find interesting. If it was, we'll say, common of the first men to have barrows, the whole of Westeros has got to be covered in them, not just in the north. The whole of Westeros was settled by the first men, say, 12,000 years ago, by some accounts. There were barrows everywhere. Yeah, but this area is just notorious for... I, I don't know why George did that. Like a whole area that's actually just called the Barrow Lands. But... Maybe a whole bunch of people died there. I've actually been wondering if this is a place of a significant battle in the Battle for the Dawn. That's what I'm thinking. I mean, there's military graveyards where millions or thousands of whatever soldiers died. And it's like a famous graveyard, right? Yeah, I mean, if you go to Normandy, there's an enormous, enormous yeah. cemetery there. There's, so maybe there was a significant battle. There's a big one in Holland. Yeah, I, I think that's why. If I'm using any logic from the real world, that's the only thing I can think of. And then Robert complains that it's cold. Well, I did not bring you here to talk of graves or bicker about your bastard. Hmm. There was a rider in the night from Lord Varys in King's Landing. Here, the king handed him the paper, blah, 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 blah. We learn about who Varys is. We don't really need to do that here. Ned ha reads it and has one question. What is the source for this information, which I think is interesting? Ned reads it and is like, what is the source? It's an interesting way, like window into Ned's mind. Mm. Rather than having his first question be something to do with what he just read, Ned wants to know if he can trust the information. Mm -hmm. Rather than reacting to the information presented, he wants to know how we came about getting this information so he can... I don't know. I think that's a good trait. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because the source matters. That's it something should that, matter. <laughs> that, 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 is, that is largely missing in the world today, where people just hear a piece of information and they're like, oh, that's true. I heard someone say it. And you're like, well, what was the source of the information? Was it some guy's tweet? Or was it, yeah. you know... That yeah, there's a lot of that going around nowadays, where someone tweeted something and then a whole millions of people will now think that that's true. Yeah. Even though there was actually, that that wasn't a, a valid source of information and now everyone thinks it. So I like that Ned asked that question first. It's Jorah Mormont. Do you, or do you remember Jorah Mar Mormont? So the slaver has become a spy, he says. So Ned, once Ned doesn't like you, that's it. Uh, you you kind of get that. That's one of his traits. Yes. If you piss Ned off or you act dishonorable in some way or you do something that he deems to be dishonorable, you're pretty much done and there's really no coming back from that. That's part of Ned's rigidity. I'd also say it, it speaks volumes. It's like that old saying, it takes a lifetime to build a reputation but a moment to destroy it. And with Ned, most certainly. So Because he's never trying to negotiate a situation for personal gain. He's acting with under the letter of the law like... He, he would never, like, pardon somebody and be like, now you owe me. He's never doing transactional things like that. So it's very straightforward to him. So you, you learn a little bit more about um, how he feels about Jorah, which is that he was, uh, he had, y you get the backstory, right? Or yes. not, Or did we already get that in a, in a previous chapter? No, we get it right here. Mormons of Bear Island were an old house, proud and honorable, but their lands were cold and distant and poor. Sir Jorah had tried to swell the family coffers by selling some poachers to a Tyroshi slaver. As the Mormonts were bannermen to the Starks, his crime had dishonored the North. Ned had made the long journey west to Bear Island only to find when he arrived that Jorah had taken ship beyond the reach of ice and the king's justice. Five years had passed since then. Mm, okay. So, um... Jorah wants a pardon and Varys mm -hmm. makes good use of him. Yes. Um, 
I would rather he become a corpse. That That's <laughs> something Ned says. And then Robert's like, jo- Jorah aside, what, what do you think about this? Forget about that it's coming from Jorah for a minute. Yes. And then Ned says, Daenerys Targaryen has wed some Dothraki horse lord. What of it? Shall we send her a wedding gift? <laughs> a knife, perhaps. A good sharp one. And a bold man to wield it. Ned didn't even feign surprise <laughs> because Robert's hatred of the Targaryens was a madness in him. Um, then we get the backstory again here about the angry words that uh, were exchanged when Tywin had presented Robert with the corpses of uh, Rhaenys and Aegon, Rhaegar and Elia's children. And um, Ned named it murder. Yes. Robert called it war. Ned said they were only babes. And his new made king replied, I see no babes, only dragon spawn. Mm-hmm. And not even John Aaron had been able to calm that storm. So I would imagine that that was quite a blowout. Where, yeah, yeah. I would have loved to, be, to see that. <laughs> where it almost came to actual probably violent blows. Yes. Where they were on the verge of drawing steel on each other in, the, in that moment. Um. Ned goes on to say that he, that Robert, you are no Tywin Lannister to slaughter innocents. Mm -hmm. A little more back. Rhaegar's little girl had cried as they dragged her from beneath her bed to face the swords. The boy had been no more than a babe in arms, yet Lord Tywin's soldiers had torn him from his mother's breast and dashed his head against the wall. So, first time readers, this is one of the first times you're going to get information about how brutal this world is, how brutal uh, medieval worlds are when it comes to heirs. They threaten the new reign. When you when you usurp a reign, even if you had just cause when you overthrow rebellion. a dynasty, you don't leave any potential heirs behind because it, it leaves the possibility that people will yes, absolutely rally around that person and try to overthrow you. So when a dynasty falls. Generally, everyone that's even remotely related to them is also in big So that's trouble. Robert's stance. Ned's stance is that he doesn't uh, believe in the killing of children at all for any reason. And that's uh, something that is a fatal flaw for Ned later on. Or I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say it's a fatal flaw. It's just something that he has a firm stance on and we're going to see that poke its head out. It's a again. firm stance, but also some of the mercy that he has later on plays a big role in, in things going very awry at the end. For him, I also think that that's he just gives bad Cersei luck. this, but right, it was bad luck. But because a lot of other people, most kids. other people wouldn't have given her that heads up. No, so it's a fatal flaw. I or, guess you could say it's a fatal flaw, but or a fatal virtue. Because it I would caused say, it caused his demise, though. No, it didn't. It played a role. Robert getting killed by a boar is what really did it. But a lot of those other but people wouldn't have given her that heads up. I'm going back to that. Sure. But if Robert didn't miss his spear thrust, it would have been fine. Right, true. So in order for It Ned was a to combination of bad a, luck and In order for it to be stupid, it, Robert had to die while he was hunting. Otherwise, if Robert didn't die hunting like he had gone hunting a thousand times before that, it would have been fine. True. Um. So uh, it keeps going. Uh, we, they, they can, they kind of um, have the debate again. Uh, maybe George wants the reader to debate this too. Maybe he wants us to think about our own histories and things that took place because that is kind of thing. These are things that did happen in our world. Whatever. He wants you to think about that and he kind of has them have that debate again. Um, he, he points says, out what the Targaryens did to Ned's family and how the actions that the Targaryens took towards his family were unspeakable and that he's going to plans on killing every Targaryen he can get his hands on. So again, are, are we talking about like what's the cycle of revenge here? They did this, now we do this. And then, you know, this is a cycle. So that's a theme throughout the novel and he wants you to think about that. Is Robert wrong or was that just the way things were? Should somebody finally put their foot down and say, enough, you guys did that to me, but I'm not going to perpetuate the violence. I don't know. George, that's definitely a theme. I've read articles where he's talked about that. So he has them 
discuss it. Yes. Well, he kind of does it under this guy's. Ned refers to her as an innocent, and he goes, well, how long will she remain innocent? This child will soon enough start breeding and more dra- breeding more dragon spawn to plague me. So that is a valid... So not only are, is Daenerys... Daenerys and this Dothraki horse lord might not even be the true threat. It might be their offspring. Mm-hmm. Where the longer we allow this to go on, the more likelihood that the entire realm will bleed. Which it go- goes back to, like, the weird, like, utilitarian ethics. What is actually worse? Like the, what Tywin says. To slaughter ten men at dinner... Or 10,000 men on a battlefield, which one's worse? Right, so this is George having this conversation with the reader again. O- over and over and over again. Um, let's see. Uh, Ned knew better than to defy him when his wrath was on him. If the years had not quenched Robert's thirst for revenge, Ned's labeling this revenge, like I just said, no words of his would help. You can't get your hands on this one, can you? He said quietly. What do you think he meant by that? Well, how are you going to get your hands on Daenerys Targaryen and Viserys while they're in the middle of an enormous Dothraki horde? Um, how are you going to do that? I just wonder why he said it. It's only going to serve to anger, Robert. You know why? Yeah. I can tell you why. It's them having the same fight over and over again. It's the same fight. Yeah, it's, he's sick that of they, it. That they had 14 years ago in And he's King's like, but Landing. you can't get your hands on this one. He was almost pleased. He was. A tiny bit. A tiny bit pleased. He's like, well, at least you're not doing it this time. Yeah, okay. Understood. I, I like that explanation. He's like, this, I, I won this exchange. Um, He's kind of like, well, this is moot anyway. Because how are you going to... What What are you going to do exactly? Uh, So, he says I should have killed them both, obviously. But when it was easy to get to them... All right, I, I put this here. There's an annotation... And um, I thought I would read it to everybody. Okay, so Robert says, I should have killed them both. I should have had them both killed years ago when it was easy to get to them. The annotation on this statement reads, This stands in stark contrast to Viserys' constant claims that he and Daenerys had to keep moving from place to place because Robert's assassins were only a step behind them. So... Robert's saying, I should have had them killed years ago when it was easy to, get, easy to get at them. Which implies that he hadn't really sent assassins. No, but I'm also not going to say that Viserys was stupid for thinking that if they stayed in one place for too long that the assassins would come. Yes, so, but why did, we, why did he put an annotation there? I'm not sure. What I actually thought was interesting about this is going back to something to a piece of information that you're not yet aware of, which is that John Aaron visited Dorne afterwards. Viserys was engaged to Ariane, and John Aaron was the person who told continuously told Robert not to touch them. Mm-hmm. Right. Do you understand what I'm hinting at? John Aaron didn't want Duran Martell's plans disrupted. Yeah, oh yeah, obviously. Potentially. I don't know why they were fighting to keep the Targaryens alive, honestly, after how much they supposedly have hated them for time immemorial. Nothing Maybe that it had they... something to do with the deal he made with the Martell brothers when he was the one... Right, to take down won. the Lannisters or whatever. Or to take down, to give them whatever it was that they asked for. Because what did they really want then? I don't know. What did they want more than, they, they supposedly hate Targaryens. And they suppose. And, and the Targaryens didn't protect, Robert, or Rhaegar didn't do anything to protect Elia and her children. And. But uh, were the marriages that had happened between Sunspear and Targaryen enough to overcome some of that? Because it seems like most of the tar- of the Martell hatred is now for the Lannisters. That's what I just said. Yeah. So. So, it seems like maybe a couple of marriages between the families had 
kind of soothed some of the ancient hurts between them. But John Aaron, now obviously at this point, I I would say when John Aaron visited there, uh, Oberyn had not yet crossed the Narrow Sea to form the marriage pact between Arya and Martell in Viserys. But John Aaron was there, and then sometime later Oberyn went across the Narrow Sea to form a marriage pact between Arianne and Viserys, and John Aaron continuously forbid, not forbid, but advised Robert to leave Viserys and Daenerys alone. Mm-hmm. All right, anyways, Pentoshi Cheesemonger keeps them safe. Uh, Ned says, John Aaron was a wise man in a good hand. John or Robert snorts and goes, this called Drogo is said to have a hundred thousand men in his horde. What would John say to that? And he would say that even a million Dothraki are no threat to the realm so long as they remain on the other side of the narrow sea. The barbarians have no ships. They hate and fear the open sea. Right. Um, but Robert's like, yeah, but there are ships. And I tell you, I do not like this marriage. He had a bad feeling about all this. He, like, really wasn't wrong. He even says later, I feel like something really bad is going to start happening around here. I don't know what. Something in my bones is telling me things are about to go sideways really fast. And then he points out to Ned how many of the families and great houses in the realm didn't fight on their side of the rebellion. So if things go awry, I don't like this marriage, and they come up, there will there are people here who will who will answer the call to the Targaryen banner. Yeah. If Viserys crosses the narrow sea with a Dothraki horde, the people who fought against us fourteen years ago, fifteen years ago, are going to rise up against us again. He's like, This is a bad situation. Yeah, the traitors will join him. Ned says he will not cross, and this is where he he finds a moment to bring up this he uses this opportunity to be like but it wouldn't hurt to have a really strong warden of the east though he uses this to segue into an agenda that ned has that's bothering him yeah i don't know if you can call sweet robin a, a strong warden of the east but he uses it as a segue to get no into the i didn't say he was going to call sweet robin the new warden of the east but he's like you need to name a new warden of the east and yes, Robert says yes. I'm not naming the Aaron boy. I know he's your um, nephew. But but he's ready with answers about. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, m- maybe not. That's not a good idea. That's when Ned suggests naming Stannis. Yes. So he's ready. I think Ned probably reflected on everything too. This little boy. Th- this is not tenable at this time. To have a young boy be the warden of the East with a potential invasion. Yes, where he's going to be essentially one of so the generals. So he segues into this conversation. Yeah, I know that Robin Aaron, that was a silly idea on my part. But what about Stannis? Surely he proved himself at the Siege of Storm's End. And then Robert looked abashed almost for a minute. And then Ned adds, oh, yeah, unless, in, unless you've already named one. Um, and then he says it's Jamie Lannister isn't it and then Robert truly looked abashed and then eventually he just says yes a single hard word to end the matter and then Ned says the Kingslayer and thinks the rumors were true then. He rode on dangerous ground now, he knew. And then Ned says, An able and courageous man, no doubt. But his father is Warden of the West, Robert. In time, Sir Jamie will succeed to that honor. No man should hold both East and West. And he left it unsaid that in reality he just didn't like the idea of having the Lannisters, uh, at least on paper, in charge of half the armies of the realm. There is an annotation on this statement that says, this statement further underscores Sir Jamie's strange place in the Kingsguard. 
if even Eddard Stark believes that he'll be able to inherit from his father. So, like, there's precedent for people getting absolved of these vows. When, when your house needs you and you are powerful enough, you can get the king to, like, let you go out of there. Well, there is no precedent for it as far no, as I there's can no see. But it wouldn't be unheard of, I guess. I think it's more of a reflection on the way Ned probably views Tywin. Like Tywin's going to get what he wants, period. Tywin Lannister is a man who's going to get what he wants. He that's wants true. his heir back. Yeah, that's true. And he's going to get it. Uh, Robert says that that's not going to happen anytime soon because Tywin doesn't appear to be going anywhere. He's as eternal as Casterly Rock. Uh, don't vex me about this, Ned. The stone has been set. And then I love this part. Your Grace, may I speak frankly? And Robert goes, I seem unable to stop you. <laughs> um, and then he asks if he can trust uh, Jamie. And this is where the conversation actually gets kind of interesting. Because this is where Ned kind of reveals some about what happens um, at the end of the war with the sacking of King's Landing and all that stuff. So Robert got wounded at the Trident fighting Rhaegar, and Ned was the one who led the army because Robert was probably too wounded to do it at the moment. Right. So Ned had command of their army and was marching on King's Landing. And when he gets there... The Lannisters had taken King's Landing and were sacking the city, which is what's famous about it. But what the interesting thing, and it's kind of subtle what Ned points out here, because Robert goes, yeah, and our men had already taken the city. And Ned goes, no, not our men. He goes, there was no stag flying over King's Landing. The Lannister lion was flying on the ramparts. And Jamie was sitting on the throne when I got there, and I just stood there. It's like my men were moving in. Their men were like, holy shit, let's get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. And Jamie just sat there, and Ned rode right up, right up to the throne and just stood there and stared at him until he got off the throne. But it is, the reason Ned doesn't trust them, a lot of people are like, Oh, because he's the Kingslayer. It's not necess- I don't even know necessarily if he doesn't trust the Lannisters because the Kingslayer thing. I actually wonder if it's the fact that the Lannisters were flying their banners over the Red Keep when they got there. Like it was theirs. Mm-hmm. And he's like, Yeah, no. I, I don't know. That seems very short-sighted on Tywin's part. I know he's Tywin, but I, I don't see how he would have gotten people behind that. They didn't participate in the war at all. There's other powerful people there. What was his plan? Who's going to actually back the Lannister throne when all of these other people were fighting and you're the only people who stepped out and didn't participate? Well, I think a lot of people in this realm either fear or greatly respect Tywin also. So if Tywin was going to make a play to take the throne... I mean, Pycelle even admits that that he was hoping that if Ned Stark didn't move so quickly, they planned on trying to crown Tywin. But Ned arrived there so fast yeah, I guess that they were just, unable to do it. It so doesn't I, make sense to me, but all right. I, I, it's not you. It's I just don't understand what Tywin's plan really was. I'm with you on that. And then Robert says, well, he was only 17. Basically, Robert's trying to downplay what he did. And he's like, look, that guy was crazy. Somebody had to kill him. If it wasn't, if Jamie didn't kill Eris, it would have had to have been you or me. Right. And, 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 and Ned's like, yeah, absolutely. And we weren't sworn to protect him, so it would have been right. Yeah. That's Ned's stance over and over again. I don't actually think either of them are really wrong. Robert's like, he's really never done anything to have me mistrust him. He doesn't know about him and Cersei. But in general... Incredible irony. Oh, uh, but... yes. But in general, he's like, I don't know, the dude seems okay to me. He does his job. He does everything I ask of him. He doesn't... Like, I never get weird vibes like he's up to something. Like, I mean, in terms of, like, the court. It's like everyone else around me is... It's always, like, looks like they're up to something and plotting. And Jamie, I mean, honestly, from Robert's perspective... 
looking at who's around him, I would be like, yeah, he actually, I, I think you're like being a little harsh on him. I actually understand both people's perspectives. Robert's had 14 years to be around Jamie and see that. Now, again, he doesn't know about the Cersei thing, but in general, he seems like a decent dude. He shows up. I actually don't think that Ned's issue is with Jamie. I think Ned hates Tywin. Uh, no, Ned, Ned hates Jamie. No, Ned dislikes Jamie. Okay, fine. Ned hates But Tywin. they are arguing about Jamie right here. And I don't think either of them are wrong. Fair enough. All right, so I think we basically got all the way through this. For the moment, Robert rides off. For the moment, Ned did not follow. He had run out of words. Mm -hmm. And he was filled with a vast sense of helplessness. Not for the first time. He wondered what he was doing here and why he had come. He was no John Aaron to curb the wildness of his king and teach him wisdom. Robert would do what he pleased, as he always had, and nothing Ned could say or do would change that. He belonged in Winterfell with Catelyn in her grief and Bran. A man could not always be where he belonged, though. Resigned, Eddard Stark put his boots into his horse and set off after the king. Mm -hmm. All right, so... Exactly. Resigned, reluctantly... Eddard Stark put his boots into his horse and set off after the king. Like he did at the beginning of the chapter, too. He is literally being pulled into this role. Yes, he doesn't want this. Mm -mm. Yeah. So, thank you guys very much for listening. And if you guys have any ideas, or observations feel about this free chapter, yeah. To share them with us. And uh, we'll catch you guys next time. Thanks.